It's now time to introduce our special guest. We're tremendously thrilled to have with us tonight an old friend, Dr. Michael Greger. Yay! <laughs> A founding member and fellow of the American College of Lifestyle Medicine, Michael Greger, MD, is a physician, New York Times best-selling author, an internationally recognized speaker on nutrition, food safety, and public health issues. He has lectured at the Conference on World Affairs, testified before Congress, and was invited as an expert witness in the defense of Oprah Winfrey in the infamous meat defamation trial. In 2017, Dr. Greger was honored with the ACLM Lifestyle Medicine Trailblazer Award. He is a graduate of Cornell University School of Agriculture and Tufts University School of Medicine. His book, How Not to Die, became an instant New York Times bestseller, and his latest book, How Not to Diet, is projected to follow suit. He has videos on more than 2,000 health topics freely available at nutritionfacts.org with new videos and articles uploaded every day. All proceeds he receives from his books, DVDs, and speaking engagements are donated to charity. Dr. Greger's presentation tonight is entitled, How Not to Diet, Evidence-Based Weight Loss. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Greger. Surely, if there was some safe, simple, side effect, free solution to the obesity epidemic, we'd know about it by now, right? I'm not so sure. It may take an average of 17 years before research findings make it into day-to-day -day clinical practice. To take one example that was particularly poignant for my family, heart disease. Decades ago, Dr. Dean Ornish and colleagues published evidence in one of the most prestigious medical journals in the world that our leading cause of death could be reversed with diet and lifestyle changes alone. Yet, hardly anything happened. Even now, hundreds of thousands of Americans continue to die needlessly from what we learned decades ago was a reversible condition. I had seen it with my own eyes. My grandmother was cured of her end-stage heart disease by one of Dean's contemporaries, Nathan Pritikin, using similar methods. She was given a medical death sentence at age 65, but thanks to a healthy diet, was able to enjoy another 31 years on this planet, till age 96, to continue to enjoy her six grandkids, including me. So if effectively the cure to our number one killer could get lost down some rabbit hole and ignored, what else might there be? in the medical literature that could help my patients, but just didn't have a you know, corporate budget driving its promotion. Well, I made it my life's mission to find out. That's why I became a doctor in the first place and why I started my nonprofit site, nutritionfacts.org. Everything on the website is free. There are no ads, no corporate sponsorships, strictly non-commercial, not selling anything. Just put it up as a public service, as a labor of love, as a tribute to my grandmother. New videos and articles almost every day on the latest in evidence-based nutrition. What a concept. Okay, so what does the science show is the best way to lose weight? Well, if you want testimonials and before and after pictures, you have come to the wrong place. I'm not interested in anecdotes. I'm interested in the evidence. When it comes to making decisions, is life and death important as to what to feed yourself and your family? As far as I'm concerned, there's really only one question. What is the best available balance of evidence say right now? The problem is that even just sticking with the peer-reviewed medical literature is not enough as false and misleading, uh, uh, false and scientifically unsupported beliefs about obesity are pervasive even in scientific journals. The only way to get the truth in is to do a deep dive into the primary literature and read all the original studies themselves. But who's got time for that? There are more than a half a million scientific papers on obesity with a hundred new ones published every day. But that's what we do at nutritionfacts.org. We come through tens of thousands of studies a year, so you don't have to. Very nice. <laughs> 
And indeed, we uncovered a treasure trove of buried data like you know, simple spices proven and randomized, double-blind placebo-controlled trials to accelerate weight loss for pennies a day. But with so little profit potential, it's no wonder that uh, the studies never saw the light of day. The only profiting I care about, though, is your health. That's why 100% of the proceeds, all my books are all donated to charity. I just want to do for everyone's family what Pritikin did for my family. But wait, isn't weight loss just about eating less and moving more? I mean, isn't a calorie a calorie? That's what the food industry wants you to think. The notion that a calorie from one source is just as fattening as a calorie from many others is a broad guess by the food industry to absolve itself of culpability. Coca-Cola even put out an ad emphasizing this one simple common sense fact. As the current and past chairs of Harvard's nutrition department put it, this central argument from industry is that the overconsumption of carrots would be no different from the overconsumption of the calories from soda. I mean, if calories are just a calorie, why does it matter what kind of food we put in our mouth? Well, let's explore that example of carrots versus Coca-Cola. It's true that even in a tightly controlled laboratory setting, you know, 240 calories of carrots, 10 carrots, would have the same effect on calorie balance as the 240 calories in a bottle of Coke. But this comparison falls flat on its face out in the real world. I mean, you could chug those liquid calories down in less than a minute, but eating 240 calories of carrots would take you more than two and a half hours of constant chewing. <laughs> it's been timed. <laughs> Not only would your jaw get sore, but 240 calories of carrots, that's like five cups of carrots. I mean, you might not even be able to fit them all in, right? Our stomach is only so big. Once we fill it up, stretch receptors in our stomach wall tell us when we've had enough. But different foods have different amount of calories per stomach full. Some foods have more calories per cup, per pound, per mouthful than others. Right? This is the concept of calorie density, the number of calories in a given amount of food. So you can see oil, for example, has a high calorie density. Right? It means it has a high calorie concentration, lots of calories concentrated in a small space. So drizzling just a tablespoon of oil on a dish adds over 100 calories. And for those same calories, you could have instead eaten about two cups of blackberries, for example, a food with a low calorie density. Right? So these two meals have the same number of calories. You could swig down that spoonful of oil and not even feel a difference in your stomach. But look, eating a couple of cups of berries could start to fill you up. So that's why it's biochemically a calorie is a calorie but the same amount of calories in different forms can have different effects. The average human stomach can expand to fit about uh, four cups of food. So a single, single stomach full of you know, strawberry ice cream, for example, could max out our caloric intake for the entire day. But uh, to get those same 2,000 calories from strawberries themselves, you'd have to eat 44 cups of berries. That's 11 stomachfuls. As delicious as berries are, I don't think I could fill my stomach to bursting 11 times a day. See, some foods are just impossible to overeat, right? They're so low in calorie density that you just physically couldn't eat enough, even enough to maintain your weight. In a lab, a calorie is a calorie, but in life, far from it. Traditional weight loss approaches focus on decreasing portion size, but you know we know these eat less approaches can leave people feeling hungry and unsatisfied. A more effective approach may be to shift emphasis from restriction to positive eat more messages of increasing intake of healthy low calorie density foods, but you don't know until you put it to the test. Very nice. Researchers in Hawaii of all places, um, a certain uh, Terry Shintani. <laughs> tried putting people on a more traditional Hawaiian diet with all the plant foods they could eat, unlimited quantity 
of fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, and the study subjects lost an average of 17 pounds in just 21 days. Calorie intake dropped by 40%, but not because they're eating less food. They lost 17 pounds in three weeks eating more food, in excess of four pounds of food a day. How could that be? Because whole plant foods tend to be so calorically dilute, you can stuff yourself without getting the same kind of weight gain. They lost 17 pounds in three weeks eating more food. That's why in my new book, How Not to Diet, which I'm very excited about. <laughs> uh, that's why it's on my list of 17 ingredients for a ideal weight loss diet, low in calorie density. Since Americans average about three pounds of food a day, right, you can imagine how if you stuck with mostly these foods, you could eat more food and still shed pounds. Vegetables have the lowest calorie density, and so researchers at Penn State decided to put it to the test. Study subjects were served pasta and told to eat as little or much pasta as they wanted. On average, they consumed about 900 calories of pasta. Now, what do you think would happen if, as a first course, you gave them 100 calories of salad? Composed largely of lettuce, carrots, cucumber, celery, tomatoes, uh, uh, cherry tomatoes. Would they go on to eat the same amount of pasta and end up with a 1,000 calorie lunch, 900 plus 100? Or would they eat about 100 fewer calories of pasta, effectively canceling out the salad calories? It was even better than that. They ate more than 200 fewer calories of pasta. So thanks to the salad, 100 calories in, 200 calories out. So in essence, the salad had negative 100 calories. So preloading with vegetables can effectively subtract calories out of a meal so you can lose weight by eating more food. Now, of course, the type of salad matters. Uh, the researchers repeat the experiment but added a fatty dressing and shredded cheese, which quadrupled the salad's uh, calorie density. Now, eating this as a first course didn't turn a 900-calorie meal into one with eight, one less than 800 calories. Instead, it turned it into a meal with calories in the quadruple digits. It's like uh, you know preloading pizza with uh, garlic bread or something. You're just going to end up with more calories overall. So what's the cutoff? Well, studies on preloading show that eating about a cup of food before a meal decreases subsequent intake by about 100 calories. So to get a negative calorie effect, the first course would have to contain fewer than 100 calories a cup. As you can see on the chart, that includes most fruits, uh, fresh fruits and vegetables, but having something like a dinner roll just simply wouldn't work. But give people a large apple to eat before a, uh, that same pasta meal, rather than consuming 200 calories less, it was more like 300 calories less. So, how many calories does an apple have? It depends on when you eat it. Before a meal, an apple can effectively has negative 200 calories. That's how much an apple has. You see the same thing giving people vegetable soup as a first course. Hundreds of calories disappear. One study that tracked people's intake throughout the entire day found that overweight subjects randomized to pre-lunch vegetable soup not only ate less lunch, but deducted, deducted an extra bonus 100 calories at dinner too a whole seven hours later. So. Next time you sit down to some healthy soup, you can imagine calories being veritably sucked out of your system with every spoonful. <laughs> Even just drinking two cups of water immediately before a meal costs people to eat about 20% less, taking about 100 fewer calories. No wonder overweight men and women randomized to two cups of water before each meal lost weight 44% faster. Two cups of water before each meal 44% faster weight loss. But who's going to profit from telling you that? That's why so-called negative calorie preloading is on my list of weight loss boosters, which are all the things I can find that can accelerate weight loss regardless of what you eat the rest of the time. Anything we can put on that first course salad to accelerate weight loss even further? Well, in my amping AMPK section, I'll talk about the ways to activate an enzyme known as the fat controller. Its discovery is hailed as one of the most important biomedical discoveries in recent decades. 
You can activate this enzyme through exercise, fasting, and nicotine. But is there any way to boost it for weight loss without the whole sweat, hunger, or dying a horrific death from lung cancer thing? Well, big pharma is all over it. After all, obese individuals are unwilling to perform even a minimum physical activity, wrote a group of pharmacologists, thus indicating that drugs mimicking endurance exercise are highly desirable. So it's crucial that oral compounds are developed with high bioavailability to safely induce chronic AMPK activation for long-term weight loss and maintenance. But there's no need to develop such a compound since you can already buy it at any grocery store. It's called vinegar. When vinegar, acetic acid, is metabolized, we get a natural AMPK boost. Enough of a boost that a typical dose you might address a salad with? Well, I mean, look, vinegar has been used for centuries as a weight loss aid, but only recently has it been put to the test. A randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trial on the effects of vinegar intake on the reduction of body fat in overweight men and women. Uh, this is a study out of Japan. The subjects were randomized to drink a daily beverage containing one to two glass to tablespoons of apple cider vinegar or a placebo control beverage uh, developed to taste the same as the vinegar drink but just made with a different kind of acid so it didn't have any actual vinegar in it. Three months in, the fake vinegar placebo group actually gained body fat as overweight people tend to do, uh, but uh, whereas the genuine vinegar groups lost um, significant body fat as determined by CT scan. A little vinegar a day led to pounds of weight loss achieved for just pennies a day without removing anything from their diets. That's why one of my 21 tweaks to accelerate weight loss is two teaspoons of vinegar with each meal, either sprinkled on your salad or even just added to tea with some lemon juice or something. Now, the vinegar studies are nice because they were placebo control. That's hard to do with food. I mean, you can't stuff cabbage into a capsule, but there are some foods so potent that you could actually um, squeeze them into a pill to pit them head to head against the uh, um, sugar pill placebos. Um, and that is spices. Want to know if garlic causes weight loss? Well, no problem. Just give people some garlic powder pills versus placebo pills. And garlic worked, resulting in both a drop in weight and waistlines within five, six weeks. Uh, now they used a half teaspoon of garlic powder, which would run you uh, maybe four pennies a day. And if that's too steep, what about two pennies a day? A quarter teaspoon of garlic powder a day. Over 100 um, overweight men and women were randomized to a quarter teaspoon worth of garlic powder a day or placebo, and those unknowingly taking the two cents worth of garlic powder a day lost about six pounds of straight body fat over the next 15 weeks. Now, if you can splurge up to three cents a day, there's black cumin. A meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials show weight loss efficacy again, just a quarter teaspoon a day. So wait a second, what is black cumin? You obviously have not been reading your Bibles. Described as a Miracle herb, besides the weight loss, there are randomized controlled trials showing daily black human consumption significantly improving cholesterol and triglycerides and significantly improving blood pressure and blood sugar control. But I use it just because it tastes good. It's just a spice. You can just put it in a pepper grinder and grind it like black pepper. With more than a thousand papers published in the medical journal on black human, some reporting extraordinary results, like lowering cholesterol levels as much as a statin drug. Why don't we hear more about it? Why weren't we taught about it in medical school? Presumably, because there's no profit motive. Black cumin is just a common natural spice, and they're going to thrill your stockholders selling something you can't patent that costs two cents a day, or three cents a day, excuse me, three cents. Or you could use regular cumin, acts as an appetite suppressant. Those randomized to a half teaspoon of both lunch and dinner over three months, lost about four more pounds and an extra inch off their waist, found comparable to the obesity drug known as Orlistat. 
In fact, I was signing a book for a woman whose name was um, Ali, A-L-L-I. That's actually the brand name of the drug. Um, if you're not familiar with Orlistat, that's the anal leakage drug you may have heard about, though the drug company apparently prefers the term fecal spotting to <laughs> describe the rectal discharge it causes. But the drug company's website offers some helpful tips. It's probably a smart idea to wear dark pants and bring a change of clothes with you to work. You know, just in case your drug causes you to crap your pants at work. Uh, I think I'll stick with the cumin, thank you very much. <laughs> Cayenne pepper can counteract the metabolic slowing that accompanies weight loss and accelerate fat burning as a bonus. Ginger powder, over a dozen randomized controlled trials, again showing weight loss efficacy starting at just a quarter teaspoon a day, um, which would cost pennies, proven in placebo-controlled trials to work, but you may never heard about any of this because there's not enough profit to be made. My section on fat blocking foods starts out with a command to eat your thylakoids. Doctors orders one on earth of the thylakoid, well, just the source of nearly all known life and the oxygen we breathe. Thylakoids are where photosynthesis takes place, the process by which plants turn light into food. Thylakoids are the great green engine of life Microscopic sac-like structures composed of chlorophyll-rich membranes concentrated in the leaves of plants. When we eat thylakoids, in other words, when you bite into a leaf of spinach, those green leaf membranes don't immediately get digested. They can last for hours in our intestines, and that's when they work their magic. Thylakoid membranes bind to lipase. Lipase is an enzyme our body uses to digest fat. So if you bind the enzyme, you can slow fat absorption. Now, if all the fat is eventually absorbed, though, what's the benefit? Location, location, location. There's a phenomenon known as the ileal break. The ileum is the last part of the small intestine before it dumps into the colon. When undigested calories are detected that far down in our small intestine, then our, bo our body thinks, whoa, we must be full from stem to stern, puts the brakes on eating more by dialing down our appetite. You can show this experimentally, you insert a nine-foot tube down people's stomachs and drip in any kind of calories, fat, protein, sugar, and you can activate the ileal brake. Then stick them before an all-you-can-eat meal and compare to the placebo group that just got a squirt of water down the tube. They eat over 100 calories less. They just don't feel as hungry. They feel just as full, eating significantly less. That's the ileal break in action. This can then translate into weight loss. Randomize overweight women to a diet of green plant membranes. In other words, just covertly slip them some powdered spinach, and they get a boost in appetite-suppressing hormones, a decreased urge for sweets. Indeed, spinach can um, decrease one's urge for chocolate. You can see here. Um, uh, you know, a uh, few hours in, two hours, um, four hours, six hours, about uh, here about hour seven, um, after, the, uh, after the spinach, just chocolate did nothing for these people. Um, they just lost all cravings for the food. Um, all thanks to spinach. And this then translates into accelerated weight loss. Right? All thanks to eating green, the actual green itself, the chlorophyll packed membranes and leaves. Now, the researchers use spinach powder just so they can use and make a convincing looking placebos. But you can uh, get just as many thylakoids eating about a half cup of cooked greens, which is what I recommend people eat at least two times a day in my daily dozen checklist of all the healthiest of healthy things to fit into your daily routine. In the Journal of the Society of Chemical Industry, a group of food technologists argue that given their fat-blocking benefits, thylakoid membranes could be incorporated into foods as a promising new appetite-reducing ingredient. Or you can just get them the way Mother Nature intended. 
So thylakoids eventually do get broken down. Fiber makes it all the way down to our colon. While it's technically true we can't digest fiber, that's only true of the part of us that's actually human. Most of the cells in our body are actually bacteria. Our gut flora weighs as much as one of our kidneys, as metabolically active as our liver, has been called our forgotten organ, and it's an organ that runs on MAC, microbiota accessible carbohydrates. So, when you see me write things like, eat lots of Big Macs, don't get the wrong idea. <laughs> MAC is just another name for prebiotics, what a good gut flora eat, in other words, fiber. What do our good bacteria do with fiber? We feed them, and they feed us right back. They make short-chain fatty acids that then get absorbed from our colon into our bloodstream, circulate through our body, even end up in our brains, like the way our gut flora communicate with us, dialing down our appetite, all the while increasing the rate at which we burn fat and boosting our metabolism at the same time, all thanks to fiber. Check it out. Put people in a brain scanner, Show them a high-calorie food like a donut, and the reward centers in their brains light up. But if you repeat the experiment, but this time secretly deliver those fiber-derived short-chain fatty acids directly into their rectum, you see a blunted reward center response. And subjects report that the high-calorie foods just seemed less appealing and subsequently ate less of an all-you-can-eat meal. But fiber supplements like Metamucil don't work, which makes sense because they're non-fermentable, meaning our good gut flora can't eat it. So yeah, it can improve bowel regularity, but can't actually be used by our good bacteria to make those cravings blocking ingredients. For that, you have to actually eat real food. Our good gut bugs are trying to help us, but when we eat a diet deficient in fiber, we are in effect starving our microbial self. Less than 5% of Americans reach even the recommended minimum daily intake of fiber. No surprise, since the number one source of fiber are beans and whole grains, and 96% of Americans don't even reach the recommended minimum intake of legumes, which are beans, split peas, chickpeas, and lentils, and 99% don't reach the recommended minimum intake for whole grains. Most people don't even know what fiber is. More than half of Americans surveyed think that Steak is a significant source of fiber. However, by definition, fiber is only found in plants. There's zero fiber in meat, dairy, eggs, and typically little or no fiber in processed junk, and there, excuse me, therein lies the problem. Wouldn't at least the protein in that steak fill you up? Well, surprisingly, even a review supported by the meat, dairy, and egg industries acknowledge that protein intake does not actually translate into eating less later on. Um, whereas you eat a fiber-rich whole grain for supper, it can cut your calorie intake more than 12 hours later at lunch the next day. Feel about 100 calories quicker the following day because by then your good gut bugs are feasting on the same bounty and dialing down your appetite. You can imagine how if you do this day after day, how it could add up. Today, even our meat could be considered junk food for more than a century. One of the major goals of animal agriculture was to increase the fat content of uh, carcasses. Take chicken, for example. 100 years ago, the USDA determined chicken was about 23% protein by fat and less than two, uh, protein by weight and less than 2% fat. Today, chickens have been genetically manipulated uh, through selective breeding to have 10 times more fat. Chicken little has become chicken big and may be making us bigger too. Meat consumption in general is associated with weight gain, but poultry appears to be the worst. Even just like an ounce a day, it's like a single chicken nugget or like a chicken breast every 10 days was associated with weight gain compared to eating no chicken at all. Now it's funny, when the meat industry funds obesity studies on chicken, they choose for their head-to-head -head comparison foods like cookies and sugar-coated chocolates. This is a classic drug industry trick where you try to make your product look better by comparing it to something substandard. Well, you know, apparently just regular chocolate wasn't enough to make chicken look better. 
But what happens when chicken is pitted against a real control like chicken or without the actual chicken? Chicken, chicken's out. Both tofu and corn, a plant-based meat made from the mushroom kingdom, was found to have stronger satiating qualities than chicken. Feed people with chicken and rice lunch and four and a half hours later, they eat 18% more calories of a dinner buffet than those who instead be given a lunch of chicken-free chicken and, lunch and rice. These friends are consistent with childhood obesity research that found meat consumption appeared to double the odds of school children becoming overweight compared to the consumption of plant-based meat products. Now, of course, whole food sources of plant proteins, such as beans, did even better associated with cutting in half the odds of kids becoming overweight, which is why I consider these kind of plant-based meats more of a useful stepping stone towards a healthier diet rather than the end game ideal. Uh, part of the reason plant-based meats are less fattening is that they cause less of an insulin spike. Uh, Meat-free chicken like corn costs up to a 41% less of an immediately in, immediate insulin reaction. Turns out that animal protein causes almost as much insulin release as straight sugar. Just adding a few egg whites to your diet can increase insulin output by about 60% within four days, and fish may be even worse. Why would adding tuna to mashed potatoes spike up insulin levels, but adding you know, broccoli instead cut our insulin response by about 40%. It's not the fiber, because given the same amount of broccoli fiber, it doesn't have any significant effect. So why does animal protein make things worse and plant protein make things better? Well, plant proteins tend to be lower in branched chain amino acids, which are associated with insulin resistance, the cause of type two diabetes. You can show this experimentally. You give some vegans branched chain amino acids, you can make them as insulin resistant as omnivores, or take some omnivores and put them even through a 48 hour vegan diet challenge within two days, you can see the opposite, significant improvements in metabolic health. Why? Because decreased consumption of branched chain amino acids improves metabolic health. Those randomized to restrict their protein intake were averaging literally hundreds more calories a day, so they should have become fatter, right? But no, they actually lost body fat. Um, restricting their protein intake enabled them to eat more calories, while at the same time they were losing more weight, more calories, in loss of body fat. And this magic protein restriction, they were just having people eating the recommended amount of protein. So maybe they should have called this the you know, normal protein group or the recommended protein group, the group that was getting more typical American protein levels and suffering because of it, the excess protein group. Given the metabolic harms of uh, excess branched chain amino acid exposure, leaders in the field have suggested the invention of drugs to block their absorption, to promote metabolic health and treat diabetes and obesity without reducing caloric intake, or we can just Try not to eat so many branched chain amino acids in the first place. Where are they found? They are found mostly in meat, including chicken and fish, dairy products, and eggs, perhaps explaining why animal protein has been associated with higher diabetes risk, whereas plant protein appears protective. So, defining the appropriate upper limits of animal protein intake may offer a great chance for the prevention of type 2 diabetes and obesity, but it need not be all or nothing. Even an intermittent vegan diet may be beneficial. If there's one piece of advice that best sums up my new book, it would be to wall off your calories. Let me explain what that means. Animal cells are encased only in easily digestible membranes, allowing the, our digestive enzymes to you know, effortlessly liberate the calories within a steak, for example. Plant cells, on the other hand, have cell walls that are made out of fiber, which acts as an indigestible physical barrier, so many of the calories remain trapped. Processed plant foods, fruit juice, sugar, refined grains, even whole grains that have been powdered into flour, have had their cellular structure destroyed, their cell walls cracked open, and their calories are free for the taking. But when we eat structurally intact plant foods, chew all you want, you're still gonna end up with calories completely encapsulated by fiber, 
We stand once the glycemic impact, activates the allele break, and develops sustenance, delivers sustenance to your friendly flora. So, bottom line, try to make sure as many of your calories as possible, your carbs, your protein, your fat, are encased in cell walls. In other words, from whole, intact plant foods. That's what nature intended to happen. Millions of years before we learned how to sharpen spears or mill grains or boil sugar cane, our entire physiology is presumed to have evolved in the context of eating what the rest of our great ape cousins eat, plants. The Paleolithic period, when we started using tools, only goes back about two million years. Uh, we know the great apes have been evolving since back in the Miocene era, more like 20 million years ago. So for the first 90% of our hominoid existence, our bodies evolved on mostly plants. It's no wonder then, that our bodies may thrive best on the diet we were designed to eat. So maybe we should go back to our roots. <clears throat> With enough portion control, anyone can lose weight. Lock someone in a closet, you force them to lose as much body fat as you want. Chaining someone to a treadmill could have a similar effect. Right? But what's the most effective weight loss regimen that doesn't involve calorie restriction, or enforced exercise, or a felony. Well, I have scoured through the medical literature at all the randomized control trials, and the single most successful strategy to date is a diet of whole plant foods. The single most effective weight loss intervention like that ever published in peer-reviewed literature, a whole food, plant-based diet. Works better than anything else studied to date. And no wonder, given what we just learned about fiber, and branch chain amino acids, etc. I mean, look, we've known for more than 40 years that those eating predominantly plant-based diets weigh on average about 30 pounds less than the general population, but you don't know the diet itself until you put it to the test. In 2017, a group of New Zealand researchers published the broad study, a 12-week randomized controlled trial in the poorest region of the country with the highest rates of obesity. Overweight individuals were randomized to receive either standard medical care or somewhat weekly classes offering advice and encouragement to eat a low-fat diet centered around fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and legumes. And that's all it was, just empowerment with knowledge. No meals were provided. Uh, the intervention group was merely informed about the benefits of plant-based eating and encouraged to incorporate it into their own lives. No significant change in the control group, but the plant-based group, without any restrictions on portion, and being able to freely eat all the healthy foods they wanted, lost an average of 19 pounds by the end of the three-month study. Okay, 19 pounds, it's a respectable weight loss. But what happened next? I mean, at the end of those 12 weeks, class was dismissed and no more instruction was given. Right? The researchers were curious to see how much weight the subjects had gained back on after being released from the study. So, Everyone was invited back at a six-month mark to get reweighed. I mean, the plant-based group, yeah, had left the three-month study 19 pounds lighter, but after six months, they were only down 27 pounds. They got even better. Right? The plant-based group had been feeling so good, both physically and mentally, and been able to come off so many of their medications that they were sticking with the debt on their own, and the pounds continued to come off. What about a year later? I mean, even in studies that last a whole year, where people are counseled to stay on the diet the entire time, by the end of the year, any initial weight loss in the first few months tends to creep on back. I mean, the broad study only lasted three months, yet after it was all over, those who had been randomized as a plant-based group not only lost dozens of pounds, they kept it off. Not only did they achieve greater weight loss in six and 12 months than any other comparable trial, that was months after the study had already ended. Right? Whole food plant-based diet achieved the greatest weight loss ever recorded compared to any other such intervention in the medical literature. You can read the record-breaking study in full for free at nature.com slash article slash nutd2173, or you can just point your phone camera at the screen and pick off the QR code. Any diet that results in reduced caloric intake can result in weight loss. I mean, dropping pounds isn't so much the issue. The problem is keeping them off. And a key difference between plant-based nutrition and more traditional approaches to weight loss is that people are encouraged to eat ad libitum. 
which means eat as much as you want. No calorie counting, no portion control, just eating. The strategy is to improve the quality of food rather than restricting the quantity of food. If you put people on a diet packed with fruits, vegetables, whole grains, and beans, and allow them to eat as much as they want, they end up eating about 50% fewer calories than they might have otherwise, just as full on half the calories. Wait, how can you keep people satisfied cutting more than 1,000 calories out of people's diets? By eating more high bulk, low calorie density foods, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, and beans, and fewer calorie dense foods like meats, cheeses, sugars, and fats. But it may not just be the calories in side of the equation. Those eating more plant-based appear to effectively be burning more calories in their sleep. The resting metabolic rate of those eating plant-based may be 10% higher or more, a boost of metabolism that can translate into burning off hundreds of extra calories a day more without doing a thing. Eating more plant-based, you burn more calories just living, just existing. So no wonder why those eating more plant-based tend to be slimmer. Start packing your diet with real food that grows out of the ground. The pounds should come off naturally, taking you down towards your ideal weight. But what about ketogenic diets? Body fat loss actually slows down when you switch to a ketogenic diet because your body starts cannibalizing its own protein. Just looking at the bathroom scale, though, the keto diet seems like a smashing success, losing less than a pound a week on a regular diet to boom, three and a half pounds within seven days after switching to keto. But what was happening inside their bodies told a totally different story. On the ketogenic diet, their rate of body fat loss was slowed by more than half. So most of the what they were losing was water, but they were also losing protein. They were also losing lean mass. That may explain why the leg muscles of CrossFit trainees placed on a ketogenic diet can shrink as much as 8% within two months. Of course, even if keto diets worked, the goal of weight loss is not to fit into a skinnier casket. <laughs> People whose diets even tend to trend that way appear to live significantly shorter lives. On the other hand, even just drifting in the direction of eating more healthy whole plant foods is associated with living longer. Those going the other way, though, those who start out more plant-based but then add meat back to their diet at least once a week or more, appear to double or triple their odds of diabetes and stroke and heart disease and weight gain and may also suffer an associated 3.6 year drop in life expectancy. That's going from no meat to just once a week meat or more. Low carb diets have been shown to impair artery function and worsen heart disease. Whereas whole food plant-based diets have been shown to actually reverse heart disease. That's what Ornish used. Right? Uh, so what appears to be the most effective weight loss diet just so happens to be the only diet ever proven to reverse heart disease in the majority of patients, right? If my grandma didn't have to die like that, maybe no one's grandma has to die like that. Right? If that's all a plant-based diet can do, reverse the number one killer of men and women, uh, shouldn't that kind of be the default diet to prove in other ones? And the fact that it could also be so effective in preventing, arresting, and reversing other leading killers like type 2 diabetes and high blood pressure would seem to make the case for plant-based eating simply overwhelming. Only one diet has it shown to do all that, a diet centered around whole plant foods. So we don't have to like mortgage our health to lose weight. The single healthiest diet also be the most effective diet for weight loss. After all, permanent weight loss requires permanent dietary change. I mean, healthier habits just have to become a way of life. And if they're going to be lifelong, you want them to lead to a long life. Thankfully, the single best diet proven for weight loss may just so happen to be the safest, cheapest way to eat for the longest, healthiest life. Thank you. The question was, uh, what about diverticulitis? Diverticulitis is caused when diverticula, diverticulosis, becomes inflamed. Diverticulosis is a diet of fiber deficiency. Um, and I have a bunch of videos explaining why that happens. 
And so you can prevent absolutely diverticulosis and diverticulitis from ever happening in the first place. Once you already have it, though, um, all you can do is prevent it from getting worse. And if it's so bad that it's you're, you're, you, know, you kind of become septic because of it, you may have to have part of your intestines removed. Um, but so better treat the cause and not get um, uh, and not get in the first place. But I mean, the most effective uh, dietary intervention for diverticulitis is indeed a high fiber diet. But it's mostly to keep it from getting worse. Um, uh, it may be, it's too late. Diverticulitis never go away, but we can try to keep them from getting inflamed. Yes. Um, a question about cinnamon and blood sugar control. There's two types of cinnamon. There, well, there's lots of types of cinnamon, but there's two main types of cinnamon. One is cassia cinnamon, which, or Chinese cinnamon. That's the cinnamon, if it doesn't say what kind of cinnamon it is, that's the kind of cinnamon it is. Then there's also Vietnamese cinnamon, and um, uh, the best type of cinnamon, who can tell me what it is? Ceylon. Very nice, we got some fans in there, Ceylon cinnamon. So that's, um, uh, uh, that's true, true cinnamon. Um, and uh, cassia cinnamon, uh, the reason we, want, we prefer Ceylon cinnamon to regular cinnamon, cassia cinnamon, is because cassia cinnamon has these compounds called coumarins, which are toxic to your liver. Um, it's really only a problem if you give uh, like small kids high doses, like they're eating some cinnamon cookies or something. They could actually, I, I have the doses in a video. I think it's like even a quarter teaspoon for a small kid is too much regular cinnamon because it's too toxic to the liver. Um, and so I encourage people to stay away from cassia cinnamon and get Ceylon cinnamon. The problem is that Ceylon cinnamon doesn't work for blood pressure lowering. We think it's the coumarins, these toxic compounds are actually what's lowering your blood sugars. So you're kind of, so the best kind of cinnamon, the cinnamon you really should use doesn't really work for blood sugar control. So I would, uh, I would control your blood sugars by reversing your diabetes by eating a whole food plant-based diet. Um, the, uh, the question was, uh, raw spinach versus cooked spinach, is there a benefit to one or the other? The best way to eat your spinach is in whichever way will get you to eat the most spinach. <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a good question. So when you blend spinach, does it break the cell wall? And it does break the cell wall, but it's spinach. So what spills out? All the calories in spinach? No, there's no calories in spinach. What spills out is all the nutrients in spinach. So you actually get more um, nutrition in your bloodstream drinking a green smoothie than you would just eating a spinach salad or something. So it's a great way to, uh, to get a lot of nutrition in. Um, so a uh, fellow raises the question, well, you know, food, there's lots of reasons people eat food, and evidence is typically not one of them. <laughs> I mean, that's a, that's a really good point. It's like smoking. Why do people smoke? They obviously don't smoke because they know that the best available bounds of evidence is just smoking is awesome for them. They smoke because, well, it's addictive and because of these other, you know, they see movie stars smoke, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, so, I mean, what can we, uh, you know, how can we break through? And it's actually very difficult, right? Food plays such a central role in a lot of social rituals and family rituals, um, how we grew up, cultural identity. Um, and so it's a matter of, you know, trying to preserve those while eating healthier food. Right? I mean, and so, uh, you know, uh, you know uh, we, if we can take some old family favorites and just tweak them a little bit to make them healthier, right, then we can all sit at the table and have the same kind of foods we grew up with, but not kill each other in the process. <laughs> alcohol is not easily to convert into fat because you, alcohol is so toxic, your body wants to get rid of it um, immediately. And so there's something called oxidative priority, where your body... Um, has a priority in terms of oxidating things that can be oxidized. So, for example, if at the same time you eat a sugar cube, I down some alcohol and eat some fat, um, what will happen is the first thing, because fat, God, you can store in the body for later. That's fine. We just suck it all away. Um, uh, and carbohydrates, we can store some carbohydrates in the form of glycogen in our muscles and liver. There's kind of a limit to it. So that, that's next up on the priority. But alcohol 
toxic stuff. We've got to get rid of it immediately. Hold on to the sugar. In fact, let's, um, uh, you know, let's store everything else until we get rid of all the alcohol. And so one would think that if you drink alcohol with meals, you may actually store more body fat. But as I talk about in a study, they, uh, I believe it lasted two years. It randomized people to sparkling water, uh, one or two cups of sparkling water, red wine or white wine um, every day over a two year period and zero difference in body fat. So we know at least wine is not fattening. Yeah, thank you. Uh, the question was, what about intermittent fasting, fasting mimicking diet? So actually the biggest chapter in my entire book is on fasting, because now there's this tremendous amount of data. When I first looked into fasting, there just wasn't good science, so I didn't do videos about it, but now we've got water-only fasting, we've got alternate day fasting, 5-2 fasting, 25-5, fasting modified diets, time-restricted feeding. I go through each one of them, talk about all the pros and cons and the science. Um, bottom line, alternate day fasting is uh, probably a bad idea raises your cholesterol and doesn't have any benefits in terms of lean mass preservation or compliance or on down the list. Um, but early time restrictive feeding shows remarkable benefits. So that means restricting your eat, daily eating window, window to 12 hours or less, so you're fasting half the time. And, but critically important, it's shifted towards the beginning of the day, not later in the day. So if anything, you skip supper, not breakfast, um, no eating after 7 p.m., uh, food eaten at night, is more fattening than the exact same food eaten earlier in the day. So the fewer calories after sundown, the better. Um, and so that's why early time restricted feedings um, show the dual benefits of both the time restriction and the chronobiological benefits of shifting your calories towards the beginning of the day. Breakfast like a king, uh, you know, lunch like a prince, dinner like a pauper. That's the way to do it. Can you eat tofu or does it have to be fermented? If you mean, should you eat spoiled tofu, the answer is no. No, I, you're not, no, I know what you're saying, though. Um, what about traditional soy foods, like soy milk and tofu, versus fermented soy foods, like miso and tempeh? Um, and it turns out, for cancer prevention, traditional soy foods beat out fermented soy foods. I'm not saying they aren't super good for you, but for cancer prevention, they work better. So uh, chemo for life, I assume we're talking breast cancer, something like tamoxifen? Yeah. So, I mean, one shouldn't think of tamoxifen in the same breath that they think of other chemotherapy. Technically, it's a chemotherapy because it's a cancer drug. But when we typically think of chemotherapy, we're talking about, like, you know, alkylating chemotherapy. We're talking about, uh, you know, uh, chemotherapy which works by killing cells. And unfortunately, in friendly flyer, our uh, cells, normal cells get killed in the crossfire, and so that's why there's no such thing as taking those kind of chemo drugs for the rest of your life. You wouldn't make it. Um, uh, and I have a bunch of videos coming up about chemo for all sorts of things, but tamoxifen is a different. It's kind of a normal a hormone modulator. I'm trying to suppress the effects of estrogen in the body. Um, and so if someone has an estrogen receptor positive breast cancer that they can't get rid of, um, it is a a, a legitimate um, path to stand tamoxifen or a similar drug um, for the rest of one life to try to suppress um, that uh, the emergence or the spread of that cancer. In terms of what can people do from a lifestyle standpoint, um, in terms of breast cancer survival, soy foods um, uh, are associated. In, we've had studies, more than five studies, on thousands of, of breast cancer survivors. And those who eat soy tend to live longer and have lower breast cancer recurrence rates, lower uh, risk of cancer coming back. And that's for women on and off tamoxifen with breast receptor positive and negative cancers. Um, and um, flax seeds also, we have these randomized double blind uh, placebo controlled trials say, how do you double blind someone with flax seeds? You make muffins and they made flax muffins versus control muffins without flax randomized women to it, got biopsies before and after, saw some mar remarkable effects, I got videos on that, cruciferous vegetables, broccoli sprouts, three quarters a cup a day, I got videos on all this, just type in breast cancer, and all my videos come up, and all the things I encourage people um, to add to their daily diets. Oh, wow, fantastic. Um, this question was, what about uh, the stress hormone cortisol 
on weight gain. I've got a whole chapter on that um, in the book, so I would uh, refer you to that. But um, I mean, the reason we know that it causes, that this uh, stress hormone causes is because people, there's a, uh, there's a disease called Cushing syndrome, which is caused by, for example, tumors that create the stress hormone, and a classic symptom is, uh, is, uh, is obesity. Um, and so then the question is, what is effective for stress reduction? And I go through mindfulness, meditation, all these things. Talk about the, the data that exists for actually um, bringing cortisol levels down and what we can do in our diet um, to affect uh, cortisol levels as well. Oh, wouldn't that be cool? So this question was, what about sulforaphane, which is the active ingredient in cruciferous or cabbage family vegetables? Does that help with weight loss? And no. <laughs> broccoli is awesome and has all sorts of benefits. And broccoli would be associated with weight loss because it's a water-rich vegetable, right? Very low in calorie density. But the sulforaphane itself, it wouldn't matter if you ate collard greens versus yeah, beet greens, for example. One's cruciferous, one's not. One has sulforaphane, the other one doesn't. But they're both about 95% water. They're basically water in vegetable form. Um, and so it would be satiating, would have all the thylakoids. Another reason why broccoli would cause weight loss because of the thylakoids, because of the green leafy membranes. All sorts of good reasons, but sulforaphane is not one of them. So cruciferous vegetables do not eat your vegetables. Oh, great question. What kind of vinegar? It, because it's the vinegar itself, it's the acetic acid. Uh, vinegar just means acetic acid and water. And so even this nasty distilled white vinegar would work, but if you have apple cider vinegar or if you have balsamic vinegar, then you actually get all the acetic acid from distilled vinegar, but then you actually have some apple phytonutrients or grape phytonutrients thrown in there. Um, tastes better too also. But, so, but basically any vinegar you want, because all the, I mean, as long as it's vinegar, it has the active ingredient of acetic acid. Uh, okay, the question was, menopause! <laughs> question mark, I assume. Um, so, I mean, so I talk about um, uh, the, uh, so what happens with, as women age is they lose a bone and muscle mass and replace it with fat. And so it's interesting, you look at the scale and you're like, I'm the same, I'm not, I'm not gaining any weight, I'm doing awesome. Actually, you are gaining weight because you're replacing the muscle and bone with fat. And so if you just don't uh, gain weight, that's a bad thing. Um, uh, and so there's a bunch of things you can do about it, I talk about it in the book, um, uh, but it's particularly important for older women to, you know, to decrease their visceral fat and to maintain their uh, muscle and bone mass. Um, uh, and in terms of hormone replacement therapy, like uh, you know, taking you know, uh, Premarin, these, uh, these horse hormones, um, uh, it is uh, uh, increases your risk of breast cancer, uh, blood clots, um, and uh, and uh, uh, doesn't have any heart disease benefit. And so I would encourage people not to do it. And what about bioidentical hormones, like plant-based hormones made from like yams and things? Well, they're bioidentical. They're the exact same hormones, so they have the exact same problems of the drug hormones. Yes. How much calcium should older women get? Calcium, um, older women should get at least 600 milligrams of calcium a day, and the healthiest source is low oxalate, dark green leafy vegetables, which means all greens except for beet greens, Swiss chard, and spinach, which are fantastic foods, but they're just stingy with their calcium. So, but bok choy or collards or all those other wonderful greens, and uh, they have, offer a number of benefits beyond that for bone health in particular, but that is the most absorbable form of calcium best form of calcium, and have all sorts of other wonderful stuff too. Yes, what is my breakfast, lunch, and dinner? Um, well, okay, so I'm sitting on a plane during about two of those meals, but um, uh, no, well, so uh, that's what the Daily Dozen is for, right? So the Daily Dozen checklist of all the healthiest, healthy foods out there. In fact, let me see, I think I even have a thing on it. And here it is, Dr. Gray's Daily Dozen, available free, iPhone and Android. And it, uh, all the healthiest healthy foods, that's what I try to eat whenever I can. I'm not stuck in an airport food court. Um, and then I have a whole cookbook, the How Not to Die cookbook. Anybody try the How Not to Die cookbook? All right.
And so those are like all my recipes. And this December, I'm going to have a How Not to Diet cookbook as well. And so you can get all, another 100 or so wonderful recipes in every book. All. Next book, which will be out December 2022, is How Not to Age. And then the following December, I'll have a How Not to Age cookbook as well. Yes. What about star fruit? Don't eat it. Or eat it in, in, in serious moderation because, um, because uh, it's, uh, it's shut down your kidneys. It has both neurotoxins and nephrotoxic. I've got videos on star fruit. They're really pretty. Use them for decoration. Don't eat them. What do we need for osteoporosis? We need weight-bearing exercise. The reason why astronauts lose 2% of their bone mass every month is because it's use it or lose it. Um, uh, it's like, you know, if you have, uh, it's like your muscles. When your arm's in a cast, your muscles just atrophy away. Why? The body's like, why am I spending all this energy making a healthy skeleton if you're not going to use it? You're going to sit on a couch all day. I don't need to make any bone mass. So weight-bearing exercise, an hour a day, seven days a week minimum. And if you're really light um, and you're not really putting a lot of stress on your bones, wear a backpack, wear a weight vest. There's all sorts of ways to put more pressure on your bones. And all of a sudden, your body won't think you're an astronaut, and you'll uh, and it'll uh, improve. Of course, you need to get enough vitamin D, which shouldn't be a problem in Hawaii, um, and enough uh, enough calcium, which shouldn't be a problem if you're eating my recommended amount of dark green leafy vegetables. Way in the back. Question is, I have a lot of friends who want to go plant-based, but they have thyroid issues. What should I tell them? I should tell them that you really need to go plant-based because. Um, thanks to the Adventist 2 study, we now know that uh, the dietary intervention, the best predictive of euthyroid, meaning a healthful thyroid level, is a plant-based diet. The vegetarians had significantly lower levels of, uh, of, uh, of uh, thyroid pathology. Um, and so, and I even have some studies on, um, uh, uh, some videos on thyroiditis, actually treating autoimmune hypothyroidism. Um, with uh, dietary approaches, and so they really need to get on board. But of course, so does everyone, because the number one killer of people with thyroid disease is still heart disease. Okay, um, uh, so I have uh, videos on genetically modified organisms. The biggest concern is not the gene constructs themselves, for which there's no negative human data, but for the pesticides, right? Typically, they're used to pesticide resistance, and so GMOs, uh, um, genetically modified soy, for example, have higher levels of uh, glyphosate, the, the Roundup uh, pesticide, um, at the retail level. And so you can either get non-GMO soy or organic soy, um, uh, which by, US, by the 2002 USDA standards is uh, non-GMO by definition. Um, but it's the, it's the, the question is, how bad are the pesticides um, uh, not uh, the GMO constructs themselves, and I have a bunch of videos on um, whether or not glyphosate is wonderful for you or not. Yes, is there a, the question was, any negative impacts of men on men's health of eating tofu? Um, and the answer is no. I mean, so soy consumption, um, uh, you know, decreased risk of uh, decreased cholesterol, for example, number one killer of men, heart disease, cholesterol is a leading risk factor. Um, uh, lowers risk of prostate cancer, which is the leader cancer uh, killer specific to men. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, tempeh is healthier just because it has, uh, it's a whole soy food. You see the individual whole soybeans, whereas uh, tofu is a processed food. You take the whole soybean, remove about half the minerals, half the fiber left you know, with tofu. But look, soybeans are so incredibly healthy, you remove half the nutrition, it's still a really healthy food. But something like miso tempeh, edamame, the immature green soybeans, or just soybeans in a can would be uh, pr preferable. And natto, I heard some over here, is slimy and gross. <laughs> yes. What about the consumption of oils? I encourage people to eat a whole food plant-based diet. Um, and so oil is the table sugar of the fat kingdom, right? You take something like a sugar beet, which is where most of our sugar comes from. You remove all the nutrition, you're just left with sugar, just empty calories. Same thing with oil. Take something like a walnut, remove all the nutrition, you're left with just the oil. It has some fat-soluble nutrients like vitamin E, but everything else, all the fiber, everything is gone. And so I encourage people not to, to get all their uh, calories from whole food sources, intact whole foods, and oil is far from being intact. 
Uh, can you change your gut bacteria by eating kombucha, by drinking kombucha or eating yogurt? Um, uh, your gut bacteria are primarily uh, uh, determined by the prebiotics you eat, which fosters their growth, so fiber-resistant starch. So you can take all the probiotics you want, but if you keep eating the diet that killed off your good bugs in the first place, you'll just kill off any bugs you add down. You're starving them, essentially. Now, if you have antibiotic-associated diarrhea or something, where you took some antibiotics and you have more than 15 days of diarrhea, then you can repopulate your gut and kind of kickstart um, uh, with uh, you know a mixed acidophilus probiotic product or something. But then once you're back on board, you just have to feed the good gut bugs you have, and they will be fruitful and multiply all on their own. In terms of H. pylori, there are dietary interventions, but the safest thing is that cocktail of antibiotics to wipe it out because it can increase your risk of stomach cancer later on, and we don't want that. Thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Dr. Michael Greger, for your amazing and wonderful presentation. Mahalo to all of you for coming tonight, and have a safe return home. Good night, everyone. Mahalo.